Good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, depending on where you are in the world. And welcome to today's HDI webcast, Shining a Light on Shadow IT, brought to you by ServiceNow. I'm Roy Atkinson, and I'll be your moderator today. We have just a few announcements before we begin. If you experience difficulty with the webinar itself, you can get help by clicking on the green question mark at the bottom of your screen. You can participate in the Q&A session by asking questions at any time during the webcast. Click on the red Q&A button and just type your question into the Ask a Question text area below the video window and then click Submit. At this time, we recommend that you disable your pop-up blockers because there will be pop-ups happening today. To chat with others who are attending today, click on the group chat button at the bottom right of your screen. And we love having you exchange ideas during the webinar, so we hope you, that you do take part in the group chat. Slides will advance automatically throughout the event. You can also download a copy of the slides by clicking on the Download Slide button located below the presentation window. If you're experiencing technical problems, please visit our help guide by clicking on the help link below the media player. In addition, you can contact our technical support helpline, which is also located in the webcast help guide. And remember that today's webinar will be available on demand after about 24 hours, and you'll receive an email reminder to let you know that it is available. You can connect with HDI on Twitter, on Facebook, on LinkedIn and on hdiconnect.com where you can read a blog, ask a question, or find a solution. So we hope that you connect with us there. We're going to start off with a poll today about shadow IT, since that's today's topic. And the question is, how often is your service desk surprised by contacts about applications or services you've never heard of? Is your service desk surprised by contact concerning applications or services you've never heard of? <clears throat> when I was on service desk, I certainly had that experience, and maybe you have too. Maybe not. We'll give you a few more seconds to answer that question, and then let's see how your responses look. Okay, we're going to look at the results. Sometimes, about 86% of you have been surprised sometimes by contacts concerning applications or services you've never heard of. So there you go. No big surprise there. Um, often about 15% of you and never only 2% of you have never been surprised by applications or services you've never heard of. That's the way things are with Shadow IT these days, and we're going to learn more about that today. We do have some research available on Shadow IT, by the way. If you head to our research section, we have research brief, we have an infographic, and there is an article on our site by today's speaker, Phyllis Drucker, and I'll come back to that a little bit later on. Our sponsor for today is ServiceNow, and joining us today from ServiceNow is Gerald Beaulieu, the Senior Product Manager for ServiceNow. And he has over 20 years' experience in the high-tech industry and is focused on strategically defining, messaging, and positioning automated business solutions that align to the needs and goals of an organization. So take it away, Gerald. Thanks a lot, Roy. It's great to be here, everyone, uh, for this very important topic I'm sure many of you, as, as just uh, resonated through that survey response, are dealing with on a day-to-day -day basis. Been on ServiceNow. Uh, we've been uh, for more than a decade now. ServiceNow has transformed and modernized how services are delivered um, within IT and across the entire organization through a consumerized uh, experience and cloud delivery model. As you can see, we've had uh, rapid growth over the last several years, in particular from both customers um, as well as growth around the world. We have mirrored data centers uh, for f for full high availability uh, across the globe. Now, I'm sure many of you are dealing with, obviously, the, the technology demands that are seem to be changing by day. And with that, of course, 
that means demands on, on your staff, whether it's uh, via support or the services that are delivered within your IT organization, clearly growing. And uh, those demands are across many different vehicles, whether it's, you know, continuing to support existing, you know, on-premise applications that are being upgraded, other various the solutions that you're trying to deploy, software, et cetera, OS upgrades. And, and above and beyond, beyond that, the entire experience that consumers or your users are now are expecting. They're at home, they're using solutions like Amazon and other types of uh, cloud-based solutions, and they're kind of expecting much of that same type of interaction uh, within the business. So with that, of course, you need to look at your systems and how that's being uh, delivered across your organization. What we're also finding, however, is that those same demands are being seen within other departments, not just within IT, but those services, a set of services that each department also is delivering on a regular basis, whether it's facilities and, and um, you know, building maintenance or, you know, setting up conference rooms or, or offices, et cetera, HR, the various requests that come across the business for what's their latest benefits packages or any types of related questions in and across, um, across the organization, marketing, you know, a role that I play in, lots of different requests that come in from that looking for various market materials, etc. Problem is many of those are done uh, via manual processes or email, etc. So what's happening is that many of these organizations or departments are looking for solutions to kind of manage their day-to-day -day operations, hence shadow IT, taking a step outside of IT and they're, they want to deploy these on their own. Looking at another step further, what reason why many of them are doing is they're finding through a recent uh, survey that, that we've run here um, for uh, businesses, we find that they're spending upwards of two days of their work week uh, on manual tasks. In other words, you know, answering emails through these requests, um, you know, downloading documents, filling in manual things, doing stuff that's not in an automated fashion. You know, if you can just cut that in half, think about the additional productivity that you can enable. Uh, within your organization um, by having a system or solutions that are in place. So again, these departments are trying to reach out. They're trying to find those solutions. Ultimately, they should be leaning on IT to deliver them on their behalf. If not, they're going to go elsewhere and try to find these via cloud or on-premise. They're going to do something to, to bring these solutions on board to help eliminate a lot of that productivity drain that they're experiencing uh, within their department. ServiceNow, we have uh, a, a wide variety of solutions with ServiceNow Express. Um, it's an integrated set of service management applications with the heart of the IT-centered uh, applications that you can see here, as well as the ability to kind of build out beyond IT. But obviously, at the heart of it, incident problem change, um, a configuration management database, not only to store the assets that are being managed by IT from a, from a network device perspective, but also software and licenses that might be used across the organization, providing them visibility, um, and, and to know that from a compliance perspective, a security perspective, they have complete visibility of what's being used across the organization. Taking that a step further, the application sits on top of a very robust platform that provides additional services and capabilities from reporting, uh, email, if you still need to leverage that from a communication vehicle, uh, mobility, so anywhere, anytime access. You know, not, you're not always going to have your laptop available to be able to have their mobile device that you can reach, whether it's whether you're an employee creating a ticket or, or a technician who needs to respond to an issue, et cetera, having that anywhere, anytime access is very important. In addition, we understand that those types of service requests that is kind of fundamental within our platform, that request fulfillment processes, is very common across the entire organization. So with this platform, you can actually build out and create additional types of request uh, offerings uh, within the platform by creating those applications, publishing them within a centralized catalog. So you have one stop for everyone, for your entire employees to go, whether it's submitting an issue for your desktop or I need to submit a request to facilities or HR for some additional information. Having one stop that you can actually provide across your organization uh, is central uh, to our offering. We encourage many of you to try out our online demonstration uh, found here at this URL. Uh, it's a full online live system where you can actually enter in data, run reports, create applications, etc. cetera, um, within the application um, that's available every day. So you come back, share it with your others in your organization to try out the application, and let us know, of course, if we can uh, be of help. So I appreciate the time uh, this morning, and Roy, back to you. Thanks, Gerald. Thanks very much for that uh, presentation. And we're going to just uh, ask a question. Since about 80% of you said that you're at least sometimes getting 
uh, Shadow IT request your service desk. Uh, we're going to have another little poll for you today. And the question is, from which department or area does your service desk receive the most Shadow IT related queries or issues? And these are some of the same areas that uh, Gerald just mentioned in his pre presentation. So if there's one specific area that sticks out for you as well, those, you know, whether it's for marketing or finance or HR, uh, where do the shadow IT contacts come from uh, primarily? And I'll just give you a few seconds to answer that, and then we'll take a look at your responses. Okay, let's take a look. And what we see is, looks like about... Uh, I'm trying to get that to go to the audience, and I'm having no success here. Can we push the results out to the audience, please? Okay. Um, it looked to me like facilities was the uh, primary area that you were getting most of those requests from. Yes, facilities is the highest uh, highest offender, if you will, or at least the highest contributor to the shadow IT requests. And then about, well, more than, well, more than half of you said other areas. So they're coming from all over the business. Uh, but facilities certainly seems to be the leader in uh, among the departments that we specifically mentioned. So thank you for your answers on that. And now we'd like to get on with the presentation, shining a light on shadow IT. And discussing today's topic is Phyllis Drucker. And if you don't know Phyllis, you will after this presentation. She is a certified ITIL expert and a leader in IT service management. And after 20 years as a practitioner, she's now business process consultant with Linium. And since 1997, Phyllis has served HDI and ITSMF USA in various capacities and has helped advance the service management profession worldwide by providing her experience and insight on a wide variety of topics at conferences and via webinars and white papers. And certainly happy to count Phyllis among my friends. Phyllis, thanks for coming today, and take it away. Thanks, Roy. It is totally my pleasure to be here today and to be presenting to the HDI audience. It's an organization that is near and dear to my heart, having started in the service desk arena and expanded out from there. So I want to welcome and thank everybody for joining us today. So uh, let's get started. And there we go. So here's the agenda for today. And if you think about it, articles about shadow IT are really flooding the Internet and the airwaves everywhere, right? But nothing's really changed in our industry other than the fact that it's become easier for business units to work around IT and procure IT services without their involvement. In fact, I'm actually working with an HR department right now who initiated direct contact with us to implement their HR case management tool. And, you know, what's interesting about that is it's an exact um, demonstration of this whole concept of shadow IT. Now, what we did, because we recognize the danger of that, is we helped engage IT within their organization so that we can help avoid some of the issues that Roy has uncovered in the polls today and to ensure that it gets implemented correctly and with IT's engagement. But as I go through the uh, webinar today, I'm going to start by defining shadow IT and then walk you through some of the advantages it provides as well as some of the risks. I'll provide some tips and information on how you can engage the business and bring shadow IT out of the shadows by integrating services and service providers engaged by the business into your daily operations. This last piece is the key. It's not the products that are being purchased that cause the problem. It's the lack of engagement between IT and the business in the first place that increased the risk associated with the products being brought in by business units. So you'll see a lot of the drivers for why shadow IT has become a very popular topic, and you'll also see some of the ways that I recommend you can uh, work around it. And then, of course, at the end, we'll take some questions. So let's start by defining shadow IT. There's really nothing new about it. It's really a new marketing buzzword, but as I've said, it's nothing more than the business contacting direct, contracting directly with those external providers 
in an outsourced style of service delivery. Or to say it another way to make it a little easier, any hardware or software brought into the environment by the business without IT's involvement uh, uh, fits the bill of shadow IT. The only thing that's new about it is the breadth of cloud solutions across many industries that make it much easier for the business to, to get these solutions. So they can actually go out there and find just about anything they need and contract for it directly. As the solutions don't need to be part of a company's private network, the users can still connect to them via the Internet from just about any type of device or software that the application supports. So to a very large degree, the cloud uh, provider uh, product base out there is what has really started shadow IT taking off. The fact that for the first time with, with cloud services, you don't need to have a network connection directly to the vendor. You don't need to engage IT in order to access that application. And it's this flexibility that enables the business to contract directly with the providers and without our involvement. So, you know, the ease of doing this makes it possible for the providers to essentially replace the IT organization or live in their shadow, hence the term shadow IT. So instead of having to get in the door via the IT organization, they can pitch directly to the business units and make the sale, which is some of what happened with the implementation that I'm on right now. Now, having spent 11 years in, at, in IT at the largest automotive dealership in the U.S., I was able to witness this in action long before the term became popular because we were an Internet-based company. So as the industry in the automotive uh, world is traditionally mom-and-pop retail environments, most of the IT services they needed were provided by third parties, and they were used to working directly with dealerships to sell them those solutions. So essentially, most of our IT operation was outsourced to providers who offered turnkey solutions. And when we purchased the dealership group, the vendor behavior didn't change, and it it continued at the corporate level. So we had a shadow IT type issue 15 years ago. So today during the webinar, I'm going to share my perspectives with you along with how we made the relationship work in a business where most of our critical services were provided by third parties and brought in by people outside of IT. And it's the last piece that's mo most critical. There's no reason you need to, th as they say, throw the baby out with the bathwater. The solutions that the business is contracting for may be great and very well su supported by their provider. So it would be counterproductive for you to think you're going to throw out the product just because the business brought it in without your involvement. Rather, it's critical that you become involved to ensure support remains great and that the service is appropriately delivered to your customers. And the good news is that IT can really be of value in these respects, and I will talk about that in the webinar today. So before I move on, it's important to understand a little bit more about why businesses are embracing shadow IT beyond the availability of cloud-based tools that make it easier for people to do their jobs. The question you want to ask yourself is why aren't they coming to us for these tools? So let's um, you know, think about the response that you gave to Roy, how many of you actually see solutions coming in that you don't know about. And it was a, a large number of people that still see solutions coming in. So, you know, think about in your head as I go through this, do you have a product like Dropbox, Google Drive, or Box available? Or to say it another way, can your customers on demand create a shared folder and invite people to it without waiting for IT? And the answer is if you don't, that's part of the, the problem that they're trying to solve by going outside of IT for these solutions. So why am I focusing on that? And um, the first thing is when I ran a support operation, a large number of requests involved shared workspaces and providing access to them. Additionally, I still see this as a weak spot that many users fill by trying to get onto these free cloud services. And it's so prevalent that when I'm at client sites, approximately 95% of my clients have blocked access to those services so that I can't connect to them um, from their guest wireless environment. And I do use these services because of the nature of my job. It's highly mobile, and it's very easy for me to give clients or coworkers 
access to a cloud solution like that without um, them having to be part of my company's network. So as such, these solutions are a perfect example of what I'm talking about. The business goes around IT to obtain a solution that's more useful than the solutions IT provides, and IT is blocking their ab ability to use it rather than making a secure corporate version available. So I want to stop there and roll that back. So if you're in an organization that doesn't offer an on-demand file storage capability and you're blocking it instead, you actually may be part of the problem that has shadow IT becoming so, so popular today. Okay. So I'm gonna, I'd like to talk about four of the reasons shadow IT has become pop, a popular term. And um, I actually got four of them, and I thought they were really well stated uh, in attending a shadow IT presentation that Malcolm Fry gave at the last HDI conference. And there are other reasons, but I thought that um, these four were the ones that really resonated with me. The first is IT lag. We do a really good job of establishing layers of bureaucracy that need to be tra traversed when implementing even simple solutions. We have project management considerations, change management, and other hoops that people have to jump through. Essentially, many IT organizations aren't agile enough to meet business needs, and the business really doesn't want to be faced with documents to create and hoops to jump through. They just want the solution, so they go and get it. Even after the business engages with IT, in many organizations, IT doesn't have the resources to keep up with the demand from the business. We spend so much time keeping our lights on that the new innovative solutions sometimes have to take a back seat and the business is told in a polite way, get in line, we're working on it. In many cases, this is caused by the next reason, poor business process. Aside from bureaucracy, we also have a general lack of efficient business processes that enable us to manage the demand. And Gerald talked about how his product helps IT organizations meet that demand, but we need to be able to meet it very, very quickly. We need to support sourcing decisions and engage external vendors, both in the IT and legal departments, very quickly when the business wants to bring something in. And without processes to do so, the need to do that is going to further slow down the act of bringing in a new product, and the business doesn't have time to wait. The us versus them mentality is also a big stumbling block. In many organizations, IT is very internally focused, and anything the business asks for is an interruption in their getting the day job done. So, you know, for key members of the IT department who forget that they're part of the business, that's a reminder that you need to, to stop that mindset and remember that you actually are part of the business that you support. And then finally, in many cases, IT just has a poor track record of stalled or failed implementations, uh, lack of cooperation with the business. And in those cases, the business is also going to go outside to purchase what they need rather than deal with a dysfunctional business unit. So really, IT needs. To, if you're in an IT organization that is seeing a lot of shadow IT, you may need to consider that you've got to get your act together too. And the reality is that IT can no longer afford to say no. We also need to be very effective at doing what the business wants. We kind of need to adopt a mindset that says something like this. You want to use that application with an iPad? Sure, we can do that. Oh, you want a shared collaborative space to which you can control access? Yeah, we can do that. Oh, okay, you want to roll out a mobile sales application? What a great idea. Sure, we can do that. See, so y'all getting the picture out there? We need to stop saying no, but we need to also have the processes and procedures in place that enable us to manage the, the, um, <laughs> the, the onslaught of projects we're going to get when we start saying yes. As the de so I, I do have a little bit more of a story to tell you. As the de facto head of the service management office in my old organization, I was involved with an IT organization that acted as a service broker where about 70% of our organization's services were brought in through third parties. We basically operated email, file and print servers, services, and a small number of homegrown applications, but most of the critical business services 
our public facing websites, uh, the dealer management systems, payroll, HR systems, facilities management systems were all in a vendor hosted environment. And it was the early start of the cloud. Uh, the lines of business were extremely good at working together with us on the successful delivery of these services. And when they were using a specific service, they were often grateful for the partnership. And that was especially true when the vendor failed to meet their SLAs. Whenever that would happen, they knew they could rely on IT to address the situation on their behalf. So we actually operated in what could have been a shadow IT environment, but we addressed it by really having good alignment with the business. And we achieved this by working with each and every vendor very closely and treating them as true partners. They, in turn, observed all of our internal service management processes, and in particular, change management, incident management, problem management, and service level management. So the level of trust and partnership that we had between IT and the business and between IT and the vendors is what it really took to have shadow IT come out of the shadows and become part of our IT operations. So given my background, when the, the term shadow IT first came up, I questioned why it was an issue. I kind of said, well, why is this a problem? You know, what came to mind is that it wasn't the cloud solutions that were the problem. It was the lack of IT involvement in their selection, configuration, deployment, and support that was actually the issue. So I had to think back to what it was like in our organization before we had successfully engaged with the business. And there truly was a before. So let's start with this quote from CIO Magazine. 70% of the people feel projects get done, that get done without IT create problems, yet shadow IT is a prime example of projects being done without IT. So here are some of the reasons in the bullet points that IT needs to be involved in all IT solutions, including those purchased or hosted externally. They amount to integration, security, data, service and support, and duplication of effort. And as you read through these bullets, you can also see that engaging IT when you implement cloud solutions can address all of this. When integration to ex internal systems or other cloud-provided systems is needed, IT involvement at the beginning of an implementation is going to make a huge difference by providing the technical resources necessary to work with the vendor on a time, in a timely basis. Risk is also mitigated, mitigated by having IT perform security and risk assessments and address any issues they find during the implementation of a solution. And an experienced service level manager can review the vendor's SLAs and determine the level of support that will be provided, explain it to the business partners, and negotiate for better SLAs if needed. They can also put the processes in place that are needed to ensure the vendor is meeting their SLAs. So, you know, as I talked about working for the car dealership that I used to work for, not only did I review and manage vendor SLAs, but I also ran reports that we used to get credit when they didn't meet them. So as you can see, building a rela relationship with both the business and the vendors enabled us to fully integrate support between the vendor technicians and ours. And regardless of which service desk took first call, the other service desk was always made aware of an issue as soon as it arose, and we had partnership and engagement. Additionally, contract management and SLA reviews helped us ensure that if we had to terminate the contract later on, data was properly turned over in a format that was useful to us. So as you see, IT can act as a clearinghouse for ensuring that the different business units don't bring in you know, services that aren't going to work. They can also be a clearinghouse in preventing the duplication of tools that cost the organization more in the long run because one business unit may know, not know that another business unit is bringing in the same tool that they're, they're using. So you start to see tool duplication across the environment. And my favorite story about this is a short one where a sales exec called a CIO and offered them lower pricing if they were to consolidate their licenses for Salesforce under a single enterprise management agreement. And, you know, Salesforce was one of those early tools that uh, popped up as shadow IT. And the CIO said, hey, we don't even use that product. And then the sales exec provided them with a list of all the departments using the product and the number of licenses each one of them had already purchased. So it's clear to see that you have duplication and, and um, overspending as a result of some of this. So let's move on and start talking about how you can 
avoid this in your own environment. What's your secret weapon? Engagement. So the key to success involves changing how you view your IT organization and reinventing the organization as a service broker. You don't have to provide every single service that your customers need. You don't need to recreate Box, Dropbox, OneDrive, or Google Drive. You can purchase them directly from the provider and administer them centrally, mitigating any risks associated with your use. All of these have the ability to give control of the data over to IT so that when a user leaves the organization, the data doesn't leave with them. You can do the same thing for the tools that your business is bringing in. But there's, you know, like I said, a couple of things you need to be able to do. And part and parcel of that is re-envisioning the way you operate. You need to fix your broken relationship with the business so they're willing to work with you if your relationship is broken, or just create that partnership if you already have a good relationship. Once you've done that, you can try to begin to work with the business to bring their independently purchased services out of the shadows by creating an inventory of externally hosted services and integrating them into your operations. So let's look at each of these in a little bit more detail because that's where the juice is. You know, that's where the juice is. It's where the magic happens. So first, you want to make that mental shift to operate as a service broker, but you're going to need some processes in place to manage that shift. While you'll need a little bit of expertise in vendor management to help negotiate contracts, you also need processes to ensure that a sourcing decision is made for each and every new service to be implemented. This applies to both the projects that IT initiates and the ones initiated by the business. What you want is to be able to have an internal focus that, you know, you want to take away that internal focus that steers people towards traditional in-source solutions. And while it's changing, it's also good to have a stopping point that ensures both IT and the business are looking at the best way to source a service. If you're going to outsource solutions to cloud providers, you're also going to need processes in place to manage that transition. And as I said, these can range from data center assessments to security assessments, service level reviews, and so forth. The last uh, bullet on this slide talks to one area that will become important as you begin to broker services and can help you repurpose some of your system administrators. Instead of adding and supporting new systems, what's more likely is that they'll begin to need to focus on integrating the various systems coming from cloud providers, making those cloud solutions work with both other, in, you know, other cloud solutions and internally provided solutions. So you really need to start looking at the processes that you need to put in place in order to become a really good service broker. Once you're done with that, you want to start building and maintaining that relationship with the business. Creating a team of strong business relationship managers, each one assigned to a line, a line of business or a few departments within the business, can go a long way to establishing that personal relationship that you're going to need. And once this is done, you need to manage the relationship. So, you know, essentially the rest of the items on the list, like focusing on delivering services and, you know, at, well, at agreed upon service levels are, you know, solidly in place. If the business unit has already outsourced solutions to shadow providers, you can also use the opportunity when you're talking to the business to discuss those solutions, focusing on the same quality points, the ability of the vendor to meet established service levels, as well as their responsiveness to the business. So essentially, those business relationship managers become responsible for managing IT's relationship and services delivered directly to the business, as well as being responsive to the vendors, uh, vendor solutions that are being provided to that business unit. Essentially, you want to treat the external solutions the same way you treat your internal solutions. It's all one big happy family. And, you know, even if you don't have an issue with shadow IT in your organization, the first two steps here on this list are, are going to really firm up that solid foundation to become an innovative leader within your organization. And next, let's look at your amnesty program. So let's say you're in an environment where there's a lot of shadow IT, you've gotten, gotten down and dirty with the business, you've built a great relationship with them. How do you start to integrate everything in? The first is to say to the business, okay, amnesty, we're not going to blame you for bringing them in. 
we want to start working with you to build an inventory of all the solutions that you're purchasing from the outside. Um, and we want to make sure that they're, they're working well for you. Um, this is a really powerful thing because some of the business solu- some of the solutions the business picks are not going to be architecturally sound and may not be safe uh, from a data security standpoint. In fact, I remember a great product that our group saw at the uh, National Automotive Dealer Association conference, and it was probably the best customer-facing product a dealership could ever use. But it had some very significant architectural and security flaws. So because of our alignment with the business, we didn't want to dissuade them from bringing it in. We actually led the charge. And part of leading the charge involved creating a relationship with the vendor and working with them to address some of the flaws that we saw in the data security of their product before they brought it in. If we had said you can't implement this product, the vendor would have gone around IT and sold that product to whatever dealerships they could without involving us. And the security flow would still have been there, but we wouldn't be aware that customer data was being placed on the system because we wouldn't have known it existed. So you are better off letting an insecure application in above the radar and working with the vendor to secure it than you are allowing it to flow, un, you know, to fly under the radar because of shadow IT. Very strong argument for why you need to declare amnesty and start moving forward with working with your organization. So let's start looking at some of the things you need to do to organize for the success of your implementation. And first is roles. It's going. This um, shadow IT world is going to impact several roles in your organization, and there's three I'd like to touch on individually. So the first is the service desk. At the very beginning, you may remember Roy asking how many times your service desk had been surprised by uh, an application or a service they didn't know about. And there was a large number of you that said, yeah, we do. You know, we, we, hear, we hear it. So one of the great aspects of redefining a help desk as a service desk is that it's no longer about providing direct technical support, but it sets the tone for a group that provides direct technical support and ensuring the delivery of of service and support for the organization, regardless of where the product comes from. In a very simple way, the first bullet on this slide says it all. The service desk owns support, regardless of who provides it. If the customer is not happy with the vendor, it will still land on the internal IT support organization of which the service desk is the hub. So rather than being on the receiving end of this, re-engineering the service desk to be in partnership with the, with the outside vendors really manages it proactively. Telephone technology can provide a great bridge for this. Rather than providing multiple contact numbers to your organization where they call your service desk for certain things and the vendor service desk for this product and a vendor service desk for that product, you can enable your phone system skill-based routing to direct calls to the right service desk based on the functionality that the customer is experiencing trouble with. So if the vendor takes first call, they can still call a central single point of contact make a a choice off a menu, and wind up at a vendor service desk. And that's how we did it in our organization. They called, you know, the help desk, and they got a menu that directed them to four or five different vendor support desks, depending which option they chose. And if they called the vendor support line because it was on a – that phone number was on their terminal, they got the same exact menu And if they were calling about an issue that my service desk supported, it would come to us from the vendor. It was a huge win for our organization. The next role you want to think about is your service level manager, because that role is going to expand to cover both internal and external service level management. So it may mean providing or reviewing reports on the vendor SLA achievements while meeting regularly with both the provider to address their service and with the customer. The biggest goal of this activity is going to be to ensure the partnership is successful throughout the year so you don't end up canceling the contract when it expires. Now, your service level manager should be also working very closely with the business relationship managers by participating in in your quarterly or monthly service reviews and also with the vendor and contract managers. This way, everybody is on the same page 
and the vendors and the customers still have a single person to talk to when there's an issue meeting service level agreements. One last role, and then I'm going to give you the money slide. So the last role is the vendor contract manager, and this is a big one in, a, in this environment. To be successful in bringing shadow IT into the light, you've got to be able to manage the vendors and their contracts. So um, the individual or team, depending on the size of your organization, that's responsible for contract management and vendor management is a key role. And a good relationship here can be extremely profitable for both the vendor and the internal organization, but it is going to take ongoing care and feeding. And as I indicated a few minutes ago, this person's role is to make sure the partnership is successful. Termination of a contract is a sign that the partnership wasn't managed, and this kind of failure will ultimately be repeated with other vendors, just like outsourcing early on. Now, another aspect of this role that's not included on this slide is that this person will also be in a position to recommend product reviews when it looks like several business units are using similar products from different suppliers. Remember when we declared amnesty? Once you get that inventory, you will become aware that there are similar products from different suppliers being used by different groups in your organization. So in reviewing it, you should conduct reviews with the possibility of consolidation but also include the business sponsors who use those products when you do those reviews. Ultimately, if consolidation is going to happen across tools, it needs to be a business decision, not an IT decision. So I'm going to take a breath here and jump into the roadmap. This is the slide I, I include in just about every webinar I do, and I call it the money slide because it's your one-page view of everything you need to consider that I've touched on during this webinar. In effect, it's your summary and your roadmap. It combines all of the concepts and activities I've discussed around eliminating shadow IT through business engagement. But remember, first you need to shift the mindset of IT and adjust several, several of the roles within your IT organization and reestablish a good working relationship with the business. Once you achieve this, you can begin to understand what solutions are already present in your organization and begin managing your vendors appropriately. You can begin looking at tools, cloud tools that interest the business and bring them in or provide equivalent capabilities, taking advantage of the new sourcing strategy you develop. Ultimately, taking control of all the solutions that are available and managing them well will eliminate shadow IT. Remember, it's not the solutions that are bad. The cloud solutions that are available in today's market are tremendous. It's totally changed the way people relate to IT solutions. So it's not the solutions that are bad. It's the fact that the solutions are being brought in under the radar under the guise of shadow IT. So Roy, I am ready for questions or any follow-ups. Thank you so much, Phyllis. And uh, I just put out into the group chat um, Phyllis's article, IT in the Shadows, Why Shadow IT is a Concern and How to Address It, is up on the HDI website. If you remember, you can get it in the Support World section. And as you can see right now, the feedback form for this webinar is open. We appreciate your feedback. It helps us with uh, future events and lets us know how we're doing. So if you would be so kind as to Take that brief survey and let us know how you feel about today's webcast. And uh, Phyllis, I think you really uh, nailed it on a bunch of different topics. And I have to tell you that we agree so much on the service brokerage con concept that we should uh, write something about it. Anyway. <laughs> <laughs> just, just let me know if I can help, it. Roy. <laughs> uh, just say it. Uh, first question, you rightly point out that IT can't afford to say no. Uh, most organizations can't build solutions fast enough to fulfill business requests. In those cases, does IT's job become one of advising businesses and existing solutions? And I think that goes right to the brokerage question. So could you yes. talk a little bit about that, Phyllis? Yeah, that is absolutely on target. I think if we continue to try to do everything ourselves, we will continue to fail. You know, there's no – and I, I hope I made the point clearly enough about, like, using Dropbox and boxes as an example – why would you go and try to recreate that wheel when both of those vendors offer a corporate solution 
that gives an internal IT administrator control over every folder created by someone within the organization. You know, they're more dangerous when they're not under IT's control. And if IT can't keep up, that's what's going to happen. They're going to go get those solu- you know, any solution they need off the cloud with or without IT. So if we focus more on the fastest way to bring something in, which may often be by bringing it in from the outside, we become able to keep up with the demand as well as being able to offer those solutions more quickly and not say no. Thank you. Um, HTI says in their shadow IT research brief that in about 35% of organizations where best effort support is required, 20% of tickets relate to shadow IT. So what is the solution for that high volume? You know, it's the same thing, right? When we get back into the whole concept of engaging the business and becoming a service broker, the service desk has the opportunity to be involved in those solutions as you're bringing them in, and that starts to lessen the impact of of the service desk not knowing about things. I have to step back a little bit and tell you that uh, in the car dealership that I worked for all those years ago, uh, we had a what amounted to a service onboarding process. And in my consulting realm, I have helped clients develop a service onboarding process. And that process works really, really well for a an external vendor. And it engaged the service desk as well. So it was not only making certain that all of the security and data center aspects and integrations were taken care of, but it also looked at the service desk ITSM tool and said, do we have all of the proper configuration items in the tool? Do we have the right assignment groups? Does the service desk know how to handle these questions when they come in? So it really eliminated the the likelihood that we weren't going to know about a product. And I would say after we developed our service onboarding process, which actually started with the business asking for a new service, so it started at the initial you know entry point, Um, Once we started doing that, there was never a call that came into my service desk that we didn't know about the product. Or if there was, they were probably calling a wrong number. You know, they got the us an error because we really knew what was out there in the dealerships. Oh, great. You know, you could do it, Roy. It's possible. Oh, yeah, absolutely. I I agree. Yes, uh, a lot of times IT's head is facing in the wrong direction. Uh, So... They're, they're thinking ahead to the projects on their plate and not thinking about what the business actually is asking for them to do. Um, okay, another question. You say that shadow IT is another form of outsourcing, but by definition, it's covert outsourcing, isn't it? Yes. It, right? <laughs> you using, know. Go ahead. It's it, it, using IT-related resources without the knowledge or consent of IT. Yeah. Um, so uh, that's, that's the question. So I, I guess I'm... Uh, they're wondering um, h- how do you get around that? Is it is it really a question of building trust? Uh, how, how does that work? Well, I, and I'm laughing for a reason because for the last couple of years, I, I've been preaching in my webinars that outsourcing is a sign of a broken relationship in IT depending who does the outsourcing. So when IT gets outsourced, by the business, it's a sign of a bad relationship. When IT determines it's uh, beneficial to outsource certain solutions like email, and that decision is coming from IT because it makes good sense from a sourcing strategy standpoint, that's a sign of a good business relationship. Shadow IT is exactly the same thing. That's why I was chuckling because it is covert IT. When people go and engage vendors to bring in solutions without IT's knowledge, they can't work with IT for whatever reason. It's a sign they're not working with IT. I, and that's why the, the burden here is really on IT when they find out that these things are coming in to go out to the business and say, hey, we recognize if you're doing this without involving us, you must not be very happy with us. What can we do to fix this? And you know, the organization I came from hated IT. It was, you know, the car guys saw no reason that they needed IT because you didn't need IT to sell a car. So we really had to be conscious of our relationship with the business. And the way we did that was our CFO and CIO both went out and bought a truck. And they took it through the whole process. And then they came back and we developed a set of products and procured a set of products 
that were um, business impacting, you know, strategically impacting the business in a positive way. And that's how IT shifted our relationship. So, you know, if you're getting outsourced or your business partners are going out there and buying stuff and not involving you, you got to work on that relationship. Cool. Thank you. But, but Roy, can we rename Shadow IT Covert IT? Yes. I, don't you think that would don't be cool? And then we could have the spy music playing in the background, and, 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 and yeah, well, it's Covert yeah. IT. That's it. it is Covert IT. There you go. We can neither confirm nor deny that we're using Salesforce. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so we have one, one more question for you. And that's how would you begin to create the value add for the IT staff to think and behave differently? <laughs> yeah, that's an interesting question there. Part, part of it well, might be that they won't be there. If they, yeah, that, you know, I hate to say it from the negative, but at this point, I think there's a, a huge education uh, effort necessary. Because at this point, we really shouldn't have to convince IT anymore. You know, if we're educating them as to what's going on out in the world of shadow IT. Playing this webinar for them, for example, would be one way of doing it. You know, if it's really making sure your IT organization is staying up on the current trends in the industry and that you're really engaging them from a training perspective to start thinking about the customer experience and less about the technology. So if you're struggling with IT, those are the two areas that I would look, but this really is an organizational change management opportunity, and if you're struggling with it internally, there are a lot of great simulations that you could bring into your organization, and in fact, uh, in the implementation I'm on, we did one of those sims yesterday, and it's just, even in a non-IT environment, it's just great to see how people respond to them. They really start to get it. So if, if listening to a webinar or giving them an article isn't enough to get them moving, you know, try a sim. Cool. Thank you. Um, one more. How do you help stakeholders understand and articulate what they really need in a solution? Many times they find the quote-unquote perfect solution only to find it's not at all what they, what they need. So how do you, how do you yeah. get at those requirements the and the needs? The devil's in the details. And um, I would tell you, especially when you start implementing products that are not for IT, you know, and I experience this because I do implement HR case management and facilities case management products. Um, when you get into that world, you do find that the business doesn't really understand the power of the tool so you really need someone who understands the tool that they're looking at very intimately and thoroughly and can help ask the right questions because they don't know the questions to ask and if you don't or the vendor doesn't specifically drive them to ask the right questions by directing that conversation, it's going to be difficult. Um, the one thing I would tell you is, you know, you've all probably lived through this when you've implemented an ITSM tool where you have to go through with a vendor and answer a lot of questions and tell them how you do business. Uh, IT can help because a lot of us know how to implement solutions. So IT, an application developer or someone from a support organization, partnering with the business in workshops with the vendor can go a long way to pulling that data, that information out of the customer. Um, the one other thing I would say is when you're implementing a tool with um, people outside of IT, I would say double your workshop time to collect those requirements. So if the business thinks it will take two days, give it a week. Um, but it's really IT can be a real partner here in asking the questions that the business doesn't know to ask. Great answer. Thanks, Phyllis. Thank you so much. Well, I, in addition to saying thank you to Gerald and Phyllis for being with us today and going through this great material on Shadow IT, which is of concern to us all, I'd just like to let you know that our upcoming webinar is July 21st, and that's Better Support Through Automation with Ken Gonzalez, sponsored by support.com. And that is a V-chapter webcast, which means it is for HDI members only. Uh, but if you are an HDI member, you can certainly attend that. It should be interesting to learn about support automation. Thanks to everyone for your participation today. Thanks for taking the surveys and feedback forms. And we look forward to seeing you next time here at the HDI webcast. Thank you.
Thanks, Roy. Thank you, Roy.